um, in Las Vegas, 11 o'clock in, in Denver and in Montana, and we are recording and we are live on Facebook. Greetings, everyone. This is Dr. Ray Lindley, Executive Director of Array Global Educational Services. We're really uh, excited to bring to you a special uh, workshop today. And I'm looking for Khaled Mohammed to see if he is on site. Uh, Khaled is one of our uh, uh, consultants. He is actually in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And it was his uh, idea because he had, received, uh, he had received some requests from several schools. Uh, it was his idea to conduct this special workshop. So we're happy to present this to you today. And of course, as you saw in the announcement, we, are, we have a wonderful team of educators here from Matter Academy. And uh, uh, Amy Grona is the um, actual the leader of this. And you'll see her photo there. It says uh, Matter Academy. And uh, she is going to be leading the workshop. So we're excited. And we want to thank Khaled again for his... Uh, following closely, uh, we've done several workshops and this is an extra one. Uh, and the price is the same as the rest, so you don't have to pay any more, but then you don't have to pay for the rest of them either. We're just happy to present these to you. For those of you who haven't met him, I want to introduce Dr. Jacob Frankham, who is the Associate Director. And Dr. Jake, you wanna say a few words? Yeah, just welcome everyone from around the world to this wonderful presentation. We're, we're really glad to be partnering with, us, with uh, Matter Academy in Las Vegas. And we're really excited that they're able to share some of the thoughts and ideas, especially um, these are directly from the questions that we've received from you in other workshops. And uh, we're just really excited to get some more feedback, some more input to, to schools as they, as they work through this, this uh, challenge that they're all facing in this COVID-19 situation. So we're excited to hear some other tools that you can put into your toolbox and utilize in your classrooms and your schools. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Thank you. And uh, thank you all again for attending. And uh, I know that you're going to benefit from this uh, workshop today. I want to introduce uh, Amy Grona. Amy is the head of this program uh, from Matter Academy and has marshaled all of these forces to come together today uh, to present this workshop. She will introduce her, uh, uh, she will introduce her uh, uh, presenters as they present. And John Barlow, I'm interested in, you're showing your cell phone, are you not hearing us? Oh, Is there a technical problem? Uh, I don't hear him, so his mic must be off. Uh, I, okay, just as a reminder, participants to mute themselves, because oh. I, I hear background, and so if all participants can mute themselves, that would be great. That'd be great. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Amy, uh, she'll be the first one, Amy Grona, uh, from... Uh, actually Las Vegas uh, in a wonderful workshop ahead of you today. So Amy, thank you so much and your team for participating with us today. And we are trying to, as you have said in your title, sharing ideas around the world. So we're happy to have everyone here. Amy, the show is yours. Thank you. Can everyone hear, hear me? me? Hear me? Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, okay, perfect. Good evening to many of you. Um, good morning, good afternoon to some of you. Um, I'm so honored to be able to speak with you today. Um, and I can't take the credit for this. I have a great team of, of teachers that have been working really hard this year and all this time. So um, I just want, want to tell a little bit about our background for our Matter Academy. And also I did um, go to elementary in Cairo, Egypt. So for those of you who are in Egypt, super exciting to be able to speak with you. Um, so I wanted to speak a little Arabic, but I didn't this morning. So <laughs> anyways, um, we are Matter Academy. Um, we have originated in Florida, the Matter Academies in Florida, who are all Title I schools and very successful. And so we are the fourth or the fourth Matter Academy that we um, there are four of us in Nevada at this time, and we are in a very at-risk area. All of our um, schools are in very at-risk areas. So we have about 85% Hispanic, 8% black, 4% white. Um, and then, and that's in all of our schools. In my school alone, we have 1,075 students in grades pre-K through eighth, and we are 100% free and reduced lunch. 
Um, we do have quite a few families that are considered homeless. And, you know, in this pandemic, we, we have a lot below grade level. We just did some testing and over 70% 70, 70 of our students are below grade level in reading and math. So it is scary. It is. But I wanted to give you a little background about our Matter Academies. Renee Fairless is my director here. And she and her teams have worked very closely with our school and our new school and so that we're all aligned and we do things the same way because they have been successful and what they've been doing works. So why not why not do the same thing? So we share a lot of staff, we share coaches, instructional coaches, we share some teachers, so everything's aligned. And, and it's important to work closely together. It's important to have that family. And I do consider all of us educators as one big family, especially during this crazy time. We really need to hang in and work together. So I'm hoping today you get some ideas from some of my staff members on things that we've been doing and um, hopefully being a little successful on. My school opened in 2017 and it took two years for any kind of growth. You know, we got a lot of students that were behavior problems. We had students all below grade level. And so it took two years and we made huge growth. And that was with the help of all of our um, Florida and Nevada Matter affiliates. So um, we collaborate. And when, when COVID hit in March, we immediately trained our staff on Zoom and immediately got technology out to families so that we can continue education. So we were virtual since March and we still are, but right now we're slowly getting into a hybrid model. So right now at our school, we have kinder through fifth grade that are coming in. Half, half of the classes are coming in Monday through Thursday while the others are at home doing virtual learning. And then the following week, the other half comes in and while the, that other half is at home virtual. So. It's kind of crazy doing the hybrid model and it's not easy. It's not easy. So it's important to have a lot of support. And so therefore, um, I am going to have my instructional coach who works at all three campuses talk to you a little bit about how you can support your teachers as a coach or a leader or even as a co-teacher and, and do that. Um, each time I have a teacher come on, they're going to introduce themselves and what they do and give you some ideas and hopefully um, help engage the kids because that's huge right now. Engagement is key right now with keeping them focused and in front of cameras. And then if you have a hybrid model, it's important to keep the kids not only in the classroom engaged, but also the ones at home. So really you're, you know, you're a, an actor, an actress, and you're doing all kinds of things to keep people engaged. Um, so I'm going to introduce my instructional coach, Karen Tanaka, who's going to talk a little bit about that, and then we'll flow through some people. And at the end, I just want everyone to know we do have everyone's names and emails up. If you ever want to reach out to my staff or even join their Zoom sessions and watch how they teach, feel free to do that. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Karen Tanaka. Thank you, everyone. Hi, I'm Karen Tanaka, and I have, oh, thank you so much. Hi, my name is Karen Tanaka, and I have been in education for 18 years. Um, I began my career in the online schooling area. So actually, I did have a, well, okay, hold on, sorry. Um, I did have quite a time to be able to transition over, but at least I was able to have some of that background information. So there were just a few things that I wanted all um, instructional coaches to know is really during this time, especially be a cheerleader. We need to be the biggest cheerleading group for our teachers because right now, not only do we have all the stresses of possibly bringing kids back onto campus if we're starting to do our hybrid model, which a lot of our campuses are doing. Um, we also still have some families who are remaining at home because they prefer to stay at home. So we have to do the combination of the online with the hybrid. So we are trying to make sure that everyone is feeling supported. So instructional coaches really need to be there for support. Um, as far as the rest of the leadership team, admin, the leadership team in general, preparing for online education does have to take a different mindset. So first of all, teacher, parent, student, they all need to be trained. So whether it's the instructional programs that you're working on, um, we've created video uh, videos, instruction sheets, We've also been doing parent meetings at nighttime, so that way if parents are working in the mornings, we can make sure that we get the information to them at nighttime. Um, some of the backup plans, if we have poor connection, uh, connection with the internet, we're providing hotspots for families. We also have local libraries who do also provide free internet services. Uh, we've also you know, talked to our families to, hey, 
talk to your family and friends, neighbors, see if maybe they also have some wireless capabilities they might be able to share with you. Um, or also out in our community, like Boys and Girls Clubs, they might be able to pro um, provide things like internet access. So we talk about instructional design, two terms that we need to learn and make sure that we know and understand in the online world is synchronous versus asynchronous. When you're designing your program, you need to decide whether you want it synchronous or asynchronous learning. Synchronous meaning you are teaching and learning at the exact same time. So right now we are doing a synchronous Zoom meeting versus asynchronous, which is similar to what maybe some of you guys who have been in college programs have gone through. Sometimes your college professors will say, hey, read this article that I want you to comment in the discussion area, then comment on two or three more of your classmates. That can be done, obviously, at any time period. So that is the asynchronous part. We are actually combining the two, and we have synchronous and asynchronous teaching going on and learning uh, because we use portals like Google Classroom that can house all of our teacher curriculum, and the students can access that virtually at any time. Now, we don't just say, hey, free for all, just do whenever. We do actually have the kids on a standard school schedule. Um, it is modified for the hybrid times, but again, we do have the students on the computer for certain times, and we do still have outside learning for homework time. When we are talking about also designing, um, you wanna make sure that you are thinking about the proper supports for all of your different grade levels. I have on here an example for kindergartners, but again, for kindergartners logging into computers, some of them for our, our population, they don't even know what the alphabet is. Some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them, if you tell them, hey, what's that letter? They will look at you because they don't know what a letter is yet. So these are some things that also per grade level, you need to consider when you are trying to integrate, whether it's fully online, hybrid, or again, trying to do hybrid and you know face-to-face -face all at the same time. Other considerations you have to do are grading considerations. Things like participation. What does that look like now that you're in the classroom only or online only? or you're doing that combination of the hybrid. What does that look like and how are teachers going to grade on that? Um, as far as the work output, how much of the work are you expecting of your students and how are those grades then gonna be reflective? Um, engagement strategies, are we engaging the students and taking points for that? Are we just making sure that they are engaged and turning in work? These are things that the leadership team should be discussing as a whole group. So that way, when they push it out to their teachers, students, and their families, they can make sure they're one cohesive group, all saying the same message about what they want to do for their expectations. Then as far as the safety for um, our students, we did run into a problem. I don't know if you, some of you guys saw on the news, America, when we started Zooming. Well, across the nation, we started having Zoom bombings where people would randomly come into Zoom rooms that were not necessarily completely secure and they would just pop in and maybe say inappropriate things to students. And this is happening nationwide. So in order to kind of alleviate from that, we um, piggybacking off of our Florida sister schools, we also started to use a program called Collegia. There is a link down there. I'm not going to go to it right now, but if you did want to join, uh, go check that out. It is collegia.org. And that is a portal where students have to sign into it using their specific school email address and their password. Through that, we can connect and partner with Google through the single sign on process with Google then once students log in, all they have to do is click on their Google profile and through Collegia, we have connected them with all of their school curriculums. So no longer do they have to log into 10 different programs in a day. They can log into Collegia once and then click on the different curriculum buttons as we get there. So that's what Collegia has done for us. And actually we're getting ready to roll out Collegia 2.0 this week. So we're getting ready to uh, talk to our teachers, parents and students about that. So on the flip side, growth mindset. Again, this is for everyone involved in online education. We have to be multitasker masters. Yes, there are multiple things going on at once. So number one, make sure that the training for your teachers is there so that way we can help provide that proactive assistance. Um, please understand that they're all going to be technology trailblazers. We are asking our teachers to do something that we've never asked generations of teachers to do before. So again, we need to be there for support. Also, we must be the models of being online citizens. Please remember that everything you put on there might possibly stay there. So we have all been upgraded to about YouTube famous 
kids, when they watch the videos, they don't want to just see someone boring talking like this. They want to be fully engaged and they want to be told, why do I want to look at this crazy person on the screen? Well, sometimes we get our personalities out there, we can make it that more interesting. And again, make the kids feel like they're still right there in the classroom with us. So one thing I like to post to my teachers is, well, what engages you when you are watching online videos? Those same things that engage you are going to engage the kids as well. So how can you be engaging for your own students? Ask yourself this, do you want to be sitting in your own hybrid classroom? So I provide a link to my website, strive to be your best.org. In the top right corner, I did provide a lot of the examples that we were utilizing this year and last year, where we created a bunch of videos, um, sign in sheets and instruction sheets for our families to utilize for, so they can streamline the login process. So these are just some things as instructional coach and the leadership groups we should all be thinking of as we start to go into our online and hybrid models of education. I'm now going to go ahead and turn it over to our next teacher, Ms. Sarah Swalia. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Swalia. I've been an educator for four years here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, three of those years, I specialized in mathematics teaching only. Uh, today, I want to talk to you guys about our classroom of the future, the hybrid model and the distance education technology that we are currently using. Um, if you were able to see this awesome setup that we have for you guys while you guys are Zooming from home, uh, what we have are some of these technologies that you'll see on the screen. Um, hopefully you guys are using Zoom. Some of you guys, there are technologies such as Google Meets, but you do need a platform for you guys to be able to have that um, distance education with your students. What we're using and what we are actually um, flipping back and forth is, is a technology called a swivel. Um, a swivel is a technology that you can pair with an iPad or an iPhone that will actually direct the attention of your Zoom lesson to wherever the speaker is. So right now we have it in a mode where you're not going to be moving around, but I can actually move around my classroom with my students. That swivel is actually the bottom left picture where my iPad's sitting. So sometimes I'll have it directed towards my board when I'm doing notes, or sometimes when it's time for my students to do independent practice, I'll turn it on and my students at home will see that I'm not only engaging them at home, but I'm also engaging the students in the classroom. Um, on the, the far right screen, you'll see some of my students' beautiful faces. That is our TV monitor and laptop care that we're able to show our students' faces in a larger screen. So we're able to engage with them in the classroom. Our students in the classroom are able to engage with them. They're able to see and hear everything that's going on as well. Um, it's very important that we have um, technology such as the iPads to get the swivel feature to work and we're able to use interactive whiteboards in our classrooms as well. So those are some of the key technologies that we've used both in distance education, as well as the hybrid model when we have students online and in the classroom. Um, I will be talking to you guys a little bit later about math education, but right now I'm gonna pass it on over to our counselor, Ms. Laura Feth. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Fenn. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Fenn. I am one of the counselors here at Matter Bonanza and I'm very fortunate to be a part of a great social and emotional team here. Um, I spent quite a few years overseas teaching. I taught in China at international schools for around eight years. And I taught English in some local schools in Germany and Hungary. So international schools are kind of my passion, my thing. Um, today though, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about relationship building and a little bit of relationship building online. Right now, since we're virtual or hybrid, the different situations uh, we've been presented with have made relationship building uh, definitely more challenging. What I'm going to say to you today is not really anything monumental, uh, but it's just something as teachers and as counselors and as administrators, it's important for us to self-reflect. We need to think about what are we doing? Is this effective? Is this truly helping to bring results to these students? Are they truly learning? So I put up here five reasons why student-teacher relationships are important. So if you walk in and you have it in the 
front of your mind to build that relationship with your students, it is going to lead to better academic results. Uh, also to provide them with a safe and comfortable environment. If you're building that relationship with the students, they're gonna feel happy to come into your classroom every day. And making interactions with the parents easier. Definitely if your students enjoy being in your classroom, that doesn't mean you're all friendly and, and nice to them all the time. You have to have your rules and be consistent. But if you have a good relationship with those students, then it makes it easier to have a better relationship with your parents. Also, it can boost good behavior. If you know how those students tick, what, what helps them to um, be more motivated, then definitely it can help with behavior in your classroom. And it pr promotes equity. So every student learns different. Every student um, ticks different. If you, if you figure out the way that that student will be motivated to learn, that's definitely going to promote equity. So, Remember that student-teacher relationship is one of your foundational parts of being a teacher. Um, and at our school, we have 30 minutes at the beginning of the day. That is mindfulness time, 8 to 8.30. And many of our teachers are taking advantage of this time and using uh, different ideas virtually. It wor it's worked better at our school for elementary school than for middle. But you can do the same activities with middle school students and maybe even some high school students as well. So some of those activities that I've seen being done, they've done some breathing techniques with their students online, had journal assignments or drawing. You can use some of the, the um, different drawing applications online for the students. Laughing is the best medicine I wrote. I uh, observed one classroom, third grade classroom where the teachers we're telling jokes with the students and laughing. And that's a great way to start the morning is laughing together with your students and helping to build that relationship. Um, also exercising or stretching, you're gonna hear um, a couple of different links, uh, brain breaks and ideas for students to get out some of that energy <coughs> in the morning. And meditation or happy music. Music is international, no matter what culture you're from. Music is a wonderful thing. So um, I think it's good to have a morning time where you just play some music. And then we have a program called Sanford, Har Sanford Harmony, and I am sharing that link with you. Um, if you go to this link, there are videos, there are songs, there are stories. So, and it is free, you do need to like sign up for it, but it should be free resources for you. And if you guys want to use it and you have any questions about how to use Sanford Harmony uh, in your classroom, feel free to email me anytime. And I'm super excited to be a part of today. And I really am excited for you guys as working in international school settings. The culture is amazing. The students are amazing. So good luck to all of you. Hello, I'm Trinice Crowder, and I will be speaking with you about engagement and engaging your students. Um, I put here that being virtual doesn't necessarily mean being disengaged. A lot of times the trouble that I was having initially is engaging my students online, and then my students in the classroom were just sitting there, or vice versa. And so trying to find that balance of doing things that both your students at home and your students in the classroom can do and, and enjoy. So one thing that I do is called stand and sit. Very simple. You can use it for just about anything, academically or personal questions. For example, um, on a brain break, I may say to students, stand if you like cupcake. No, excuse me. I may say, um, if this applies to you, stand. Are you an only child? And then the students would stand that that applies to. Uh, do you like pizza? Stand, sit that sort of thing. It allows the students to, to know each other because they can see who's also standing. And it allows for you to get to know your students as well. Another thing I like to do is you gotta remember, everybody's been home for so long and inactive for so long. And so the superhero workout, the superhero workout, I just, it's, it's just a workout. I call it a superhero workout because I teach fifth graders, they're 10. Superhero sounds so much better than just workout, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I themed my workout after Marvel and Marvel characters. 
And so what we do is we might do an exercise called Thor and it mimics throwing a hammer. We might do an exercise called the Spider-Man and it mimics shooting webs, whatever. As long as it keeps them physically active and engaged, you can model it after anything that makes your students comfortable or whatever they're currently interested in, but it keeps them engaged and it keeps them involved. Another thing I like to do is Would You Rather. This is a game that just about anybody has played at some point. But what I like about this one is that it allows for me to engage my students in more meaningful conversations. So you can have something simple like, uh, one of the questions I ask my students is would you rather have like obsessively large, excuse me, excessively large hands or excessively large feet? And they were like, uh, so it just gets them thinking. But also another question that I asked was, would you rather cure world hunger or poverty? And the reason I ask these types of questions is because that starts a conversation. Depending upon what I'm going to teach for that day, I may ask a question that engages them in a way that makes them think beyond just simple questions and gets them to go a little bit deeper that gets them engaged in whatever's happening later on in the lesson. And finally, everyone wants to celebrate their victories. Now we cannot spend all day um, Maybe you've been to some sort of an event where there's that one person that's really excited to clap <laughs> and they never know when it's time to stop. And so what we do is something called two claps and two claps is very simple. Um, I'm gonna see if the folks in the room will engage me in this one. Um, shout out to Miss Welia who just passed her lesson. Two claps and we're done and we move on. And the reason we do that is because number one, it, encourages the other students who may be moving a little more slowly and encourage them like, I want my clap. So let me get let me get on task. And it reminds the students what we're doing without having to say, let's get back on task. Once I celebrate this student, everyone wants their celebration as well. And beyond that, it shows us as people later on in life that you, you do want to celebrate your victories, even the smallest victories, but don't spend all day there, move on. So if you just say to your students, clap, you're gonna have that enthusiastic clapper that's still clapping a whole minute later. <laughs> so two claps keeps it simple. It allows us to celebrate. It allows us to acknowledge our, um, our, I just drew a blank, but it allows us to acknowledge the students who are doing well and we move on. Finally, I posted there a few uh, clickable resources for when this slide is shared to all of you. Um, Kahoot is something that we all use or have used at some point um, here in the school that allows for us to give quizzes, not, not quizzes, but interactive. So for example, Kahoot, you would go on, um, I ask questions or I post up the questions and then the students click on their end and then it shows a poll of who's doing well. And so it allows them to be interactive and it allows them to be engaged and it could be review for a test or it could just be fun um, information. Code.org is, is coding. Um, frankly, students are going to be using students, um, excuse me, technology even more. And so ultimately at some point, maybe these students will be the ones coding these things. Um, some of this technology works wonderfully. And some of it still has its glitches. And so it allows for the students to maybe at some point be the ones to, flip, to fix those glitches. And finally, Prodigy is a math game that I use with my students. It allows for them to go online and play, um, in a safe environment and interact with each other. So the world that you go into, if all of the students join that same world, I'm putting that in air quotes, um, they, are a lot, they can interact and challenge each other. And so it's important for us to stay engaged with our students, but please don't ever take for granted that it's just, import, just as important for our students to engage with each other, even though there's some are at home and some are in school. In any event, I hope that was helpful for you and I thank you very much for having us. You have a wonderful day. Hello, great to be with you. My name is Peter Portman, and this is my seventh year teaching, and I teach everybody's favorite subject, which is music. <laughs> Uh, a few things I want to cover. Firstly, is that uh, with any technology, you run the risk of what's called the learning curve, right? So no matter what piece of technology you use, whether it be hardware or software, a program, an app, whatever it is, you have to consider, um, is this going to be difficult for my students to learn? So for me as a specialist, 
I only have about 35 minutes with the, with the kids. So I don't like to spend a lot of time um, teaching the kids how to use a program, how to use an app or whatever. So I, I definitely recommend that whenever you're considering using a piece of technology or an app or program, consider the learning curve involved in teaching that to the students. So something very important. Now, as, as far as music goes, something that I run into is the issue of latency. Now, latency is the time it takes from when you say something to when your kids hear it and then they respond back to you. There's a couple second delay. Now, obviously, as a, a music teacher, that's an issue because we can't time things up correctly. So one thing that I use, which is for mostly assessment purposes, is a program called Loom. I really like Loom because it comes in different forms. There's an app for iPads and iPhones, as well as other uh, Android devices. It also plugs right into your Chrome browser. So if your students use Google Chrome, the extension is a little extension that plugs right into your Google Chrome browser. And the way we did, we did it is we had our tech company um, download it automatically for the students. So they automatically had it in their Chrome browser. And what Loom is, is it's essentially a screen capture program. It captures the, the student's screen, it records their microphone, and it also shows their uh, webcam in a little bubble in the corner. And I like this because I can give students uh, a video, I can give them sheet music, I can give them like a karaoke track, and they can perform along with that, record themselves playing or singing along with that track, and then it creates a video with their webcam, with their screen, with their microphone, and it's all based in the cloud. So they can share that video with me just by sharing a link. So very easy to use. Again, I use Loom, great for assessment if you are a music teacher, or if you just want to use it as a, a you know, general classroom teacher, it's also a great resource. The second thing I use is uh, an embeddable virtual piano. So we run the issue with music uh, with students not having instruments. Many of them don't have pianos or guitars in the home. So to combat that, I have a embeddable virtual piano. This is a, a virtual piano that you can install in any um, web app or web page rather. And you can uh, equip it, like I like to use it with uh, sheet music or I'll put notes on the screen. That way it's all on one screen for the, the students and they can, um, they can play along with the, with the music there, as you can see on the right screen there. Um, I also use this with Loom where the kids will record themselves playing it and that way they can submit it uh, as an assessment. Here's a picture of my setup that I use. I have some light umbrellas and I just like those because when you're doing music and you're trying to show kids like fingering on a recorder, you really need good lighting to show detail so students can really see exactly how you're doing something. Uh, so lighting is very important. I also have obviously a big monitor there and on my laptop. I have a USB microphone I like to plug in that's a little bit more mobile. It's on a boom stand, so I can move it around to wherever I need it to be. Uh, another feature I use is share computer sound. So if you're using Zoom, when students go to share their screen, there's a little checkbox they can check to share their computer sound. And that's great for when they're using virtual instruments. If you want to assess them over Zoom, uh, make sure they click that so that you can hear their sound coming through the speakers. A few programs I use for communication. I use Google Classroom just to stay in touch with the students and post assignments. I use uh, Class Dojo because many of the teachers are already using that, so don't reinvent the wheel. I also have a Google site that I use with students for static information. As far as engagement and assessment strategies, I use Pear Deck occasionally. Uh, Pear Deck sometimes takes some time to set up. So uh, with a class of only 35 minutes, sometimes I try and stray away from that, again, with the, uh, the learning curve. Uh, Google Forms are also useful for doing assessments. I also have, like I said, have students share their screen with their sound so I can assess them over Zoom. A couple of programs that are just for fun. We have Incredibox, very engaging. Students love it. It's very interactive, very visual. Uh, and Chrome Music Lab also has a lot of great music apps for students to use. So that is essentially the bulk of my musical suggestions. There are plenty of programs out there, but find the ones that work for you. And uh, make, like I said, check out, make sure that you're not doing anything that's too difficult for students to learn, because that's a, that's a big issue. So next up, we have Sarah, uh, Sarah coming back on for us. Thank you so much. Hello there again. My name is Sarah Suelia, and I do teach math. I taught math in third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Um, I think this year is obviously the first, the second year I've taught third, which is the youngest that I've taught math exclusively to. And it's also obviously my first time teaching math virtually. Um, back in March, we were thrown into a situation where we were not able to see our kids and we weren't able to be in the building as well using the technology that we have now. And so I really had to figure out quite quickly how to engage my students 
while teaching math virtually. I know that you guys have curriculums. Um, I'm sure of that, that all, all of your schools that you guys have curriculums that you're using, but a lot of these techniques are for you to engage them in their questioning and the engagement when you're actually teaching them the stuff that you have. This can be used down in kindergarten. It could be also used in middle school, high school level. So um, engaging my entire group of nonverbal cues really helped me engage my students when they were at home and all I saw was a small screen of their face. Um, I understand that having them all unmute at the same time causes a lot of feedback and a lot of distraction to the learning environment of others. So I had to figure out better ways for my students to show their answers. Um, a lot of the things that I've been doing are hand signals, um, thumbs up, thumbs down. I've been teaching my students how to show their answers in numbers with their fingers. Um, I've been showing my students how to nod yes or no. Um, a lot of other things that they, we've been doing are teaching our students, um, if it's a multiple choice question, if, if you just teach them the first four letters of sign language, they'll be able to uh, motion with you if they think it's A, B, C, or D. Uh, again, another suggestion that Ms. Crowder has with students standing up or sitting down, whether they think it's yes, no, true, or false. Um, a lot of great things that we also do in mathematics is have the ability to have whiteboards for our students. Um, we do have pickup times for our students to pick up supplies as well as their workbooks or any other papers that they might need. So we did give them, uh, we didn't have whiteboards to give the students. So I gave them a good old sheet protector with a piece of paper in it and a whiteboard marker. So they did have a whiteboard at home. Um, they're able to show their answers in that dark black ink and I'm able to see it from across the room or I'm able to see it when I'm sitting and being able to zoom my whole class at the same time. Um, I do want to preference that I am a hybrid teacher right now, so I do have half of my class in the classroom setting Monday through Thursday, and I have the rest of my class online. Um, we are um, not asynchronous, synchronous learning um, together. So we are doing the same things together at home and in the classroom. So what I found was we have the ability in Zoom to create breakout rooms, and breakout rooms really is the virtual way that I can do small groups with my students. Um, I have students in the classroom that I can monitor and I let those students be the leader in the class of these breakout rooms. So instead of needing 16 different technologies to be able to see what the students are doing, I have a student representative in the classroom that are able to do these breakout rooms with their with their classmates. And I'm able to have that group work and I'm able to have that conversations and that um, that discourse that I want the students to have, especially on the online setting. Um, so I hope some of those help you when you guys are teaching in the math uh, setting virtually. I did give you guys a link whenever you're able to have this presentation of a great website that has virtual math manipulatives. I know we are unable to uh, give a whole class, or a class, um, a class, what? Set. set. Class set. That's the word. I were unable to give people a class set of these manipulatives because we might not get them back. So what we had to find was we had to find a virtual math manipulative website that also goes uh, different grade bands. So I do have counting bears for my friends in kindergarten first. I have fraction tiles, fraction circles for my friends in those intermediate grades. And I also have number lines and graphs for my friends that are in middle school and high school. So I really urge you guys to go onto that website when you guys are able to have this presentation and I will be bringing it to my ELA team and I'm going to bring in some awesome kindergarten teachers, a wife and husband duo. <clears throat> Here you go, friends. Thank you. All right. Hello, my name is Patrick Harlan and this is I am Eve Harlan, and we are both kindergarten teachers here at Matter Bonanza. Um, I'm going to let Mr. Harlan Thank take you. the lead. <laughs> yes, teaching online to successfully teach reading. Uh, first, we need to capture our students' attention. Um, so on our PowerPoint, I listed a couple of just quick ways we can capture our attention. For example, I will say one, two, three, eyes on me, and my students will say one, two, eyes on you. So once we get their attention really quick, then I can undergo a little reading learning strategy. Uh, so for example, when I'm teaching letter names and letter sounds, I can use a flashcard. Uh, maybe move a little closer. Um, once we're looking at the flashcards, it's important that they're not only they're not only listening to the sounds that I'm saying, but they're visually looking at the letters um, so they can recognize them later on. 
Uh, so for example, when I'm showing these cards, I will say letter is, they will say B. And then I will say sound is, and they will say B, B. So I'm giving a little visual clue as well as how to memorize that sound. Um, another thing, kindergartners need routine, they need consistency. So another way that I can capture their attention is before we start an activity, I'll say, let's begin. And that's just a quick, easy little way that our students at home and in class know we're getting ready to start an activity. So when we're learning these little reading strategies, there's some attention getters that you guys can use. Awesome, thank you. And I do a lot of phonics engagement strategies. So of course the best one you could do is sing a song, right? There's tons of resources that are free on YouTube. We do a lot of Jack Hartman and have fun teaching. We get the students up, they're dancing, they're singing, they're moving. You know they're engaged by their movements. And um, that's really important to make sure that they are moving because you can't have them all unmuted. If you do, it's gonna sound like a complete disaster. Um, so it's important to see them do movements. But just like Mr. Harlan was saying, he has his letter B. And if you wanna know a student saying B, you can just have them do the movement and you can see their lips moving. So you can have them go buh, like they're bouncing a ball. That's something that's awesome. Or you could have different participation movements, like just come up with anything. Have the classroom come up with things, like pat your head if you know, what letter this is, but just something simple. And then you can see the engagement go throughout your classroom. Um, another thing was our whiteboards and markers. I use these all the time. I really do. Um, and I use them for exit tickets and for games for the kids to play. So an easy way to use this for an exit ticket, you could have them write their sight word. You could do spelling words and have them write it, say, oh, it's a secret. Just give me a thumbs up when you're done and give them a couple of seconds and then say, ready, set, go. And they can all hold up their sight right at the same time. And that's something that's super simple, super easy to get them engaged and playing different games. It's important for them to play games that gets them motivated. Um, and you can get them motivated too by having like a secret student of the day or a secret champion of the day. And all you gotta say is, Oh, I see my secret champions listening. You know, just pick one out at the beginning and then give them a shout out on Class Dojo. And like, um, you can write it on your story, you can message their parents, any of that will definitely work. Or have the um, person who's participating the most pick whatever brain break they're gonna do. What's their favorite one to dance to or their favorite activity to do. And that's super simple and easy ways to teach reading K through two. All right, so we have up next Mr. Batista, and he's going to talk about intermediate reading. Thank you guys for your time. <clears throat> oh. Okay, this one. Yeah. And then switch up on the of the camera. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to do the access really quick? It doesn't look like that link is working. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have the microphone? Oh, I don't. Here, hand me the microphone real quick, friend. Mm -hmm. Okay, real quick, I just need a microphone. Thank you. While they're trying to set up for intermediate reading, I know he's got a few different slides. I just wanted to, I'm, I'm Amy Grana, for those that came in late. I'm the principal here at Matter Academy. I also want to say the importance of um, parent engagement and um, getting the kids um, excited about not only learning, but having the communication open with parents and Zooming with parents and keeping them posted as to what's going on, sending out newsletters, sending out emails, so in middle school, it was really crazy this year that they really wanted spirit days because they were on virtually and they, you know, things were getting monotonous. So having spirit days once in a while, hey, let's wear football jerseys one day, um, just do some celebrations like that. Kids initiatives as well. So if they're doing really great on their testing, if they're doing great on, on academically or um, anything like that, 
give out some incentives, send gift cards to the houses or praise them on Facebook, Instagram, um, do shout outs. So incentivizing things is so, so important. Um, and then we've also had drive through like spirit weeks where we had a haunted drive through for Halloween and we'll have a light show drive through for around Christmas time. So just having that parent involvement and doing fundraisers as well, but also using the safety precautions to have the parents stay in their cars. Okay, so just some other things like that. Ren, Mr. Bellatisa, are you ready? Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. I'll just put this in here. Okay, um, let's get started. I am Mr. Bautista. Uh, I teach fourth grade ELA. Uh, I've been teaching uh, a matter for about three years. Um, a while back, I was also teaching uh, English through drama in Japan for about four years. So that was also useful. Welcome to Mr. Batista's class. It's learning time. Yay. Uh, that's a little intro I had for uh, my class. Uh, I'm basically going to take you through a mini condensed, very condensed version of an ELA lesson. Um, something I like to do is ask them if they have their materials, they're in a quiet place, camera should be on, uh, and uh, try to save the bathroom and eating to the breaks. Students should be reminded of expectations at the beginning of class. Uh, today's lesson, like I said, my name is Ren Bautista. I teach fourth grade ELA. Uh, the objective today is I can use technology and creativity to enhance my teaching. Uh, today we're going to explore how I use Google slide options and design concepts and maybe some other stuff to teach spelling, grammar, vocabulary, and comprehension of literature. Uh, for example, I am controlling not only what you see on this slide, but when you see it. Take advantage of transition and animation options on Google Slides. You don't want to um, attack the students with a wall of text, essentially. Uh, let's also be mindful of color, layout, and composition in our slides. Uh, first, um, first thing I want to point out is that we're not using paper. So you can use as many slides as you want. Take advantage of the space and the transition options. Let's say, for example, uh, I was introducing spelling words. I might ask them to please listen and repeat. And for uh, demonstration purposes, I'm going to have this student help me. All right. Climb. Climb. Pies. Pies. Well, there's a little bit of a delay. <laughs> Height. <laughs> Height. <laughs> All right. And it would be a much longer list, of course, in a normal class. And I would ask them, what's the pattern? Thank you. Go. Um, I would ask them, what's the pattern? Uh, All the words have a long I sound. We would have a discussion about that. Uh, for grammar, we would talk about the concepts. Uh, nouns can be a person, place, or thing and then um, give them to the directions for the exercise that they would do. And then we would practice uh, trying to identify the plural nouns in this sentence, and then uh, going through the answer, maybe another example, and then another answer. Remember, animation can keep flow of information dynamic and engaging. All right, uh, vocabulary. Um, the way I like to introduce vocabulary is introduce pictures to provide context um, and also sentences. I also like to have students write their working definitions of the words. How would they define the word using their own words? Because if they don't understand the definition, then the, the definition doesn't do them that, that much good. And we would go through the vocabulary words, each time they would be taking uh, notes in their notebooks and using uh, the sentences for context clues and finding context clues is a valuable vocabulary skill that we definitely practice all the time. 
Um, this is the last part uh, of my presentation where we go over character traits. Um, I mean, literature. Uh, so I might introduce character traits this way. Uh, again, trying to keep the text dynamic and um, having kids help me uh, figure out like uh, what characters do these character traits apply to maybe. Uh, say we're reading the story. Um, I believe Karen uh, made a, a big push for being engaging and I, I strongly agree. Uh, so if I were reading the beginning of this text, uh, if they think I'm going to their ridiculous wedding, ha, may they have a dozen ugly tadpole children. Agua, water from the well, my son, before I die of thirst. I'm no water boy, I'm the Viceroy's son. Go get your own water, you old cucaracha. Um, so yeah, keeping it dynamic. Um, going through that, uh, the kids really get into it and um, I make a big deal about how dialogue and actions of the characters are evidence of their character traits. So this may lead to a discussion based on their dialogue and actions. What character traits would you use to describe Felipe and Vieja Sabia? And then I would ask them what their text evidence is and they would um, lead to, this would lead to another discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we just explored examples of teaching, spelling, grammar, vocabulary, and literature very quickly. Uh, what is one thing that you could maybe take away? I know maybe some of you guys are experts at Google Slides and I know all this, but um, some things I had to remind myself about when, when teaching children. Uh, and when all else fails, do, uh, pull out all the stops, do whatever it takes, I have puppets, I have ukuleles, I have harmonicas, tambourines, whatever works, whatever keeps them engaged. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Trevor Harder and I am a middle school science teacher here at Matter Bonanza. And I've been teaching for uh, five years across the United States and um, a brief stint in Taiwan as well. And when we're thinking about creating engaging science lessons online, just like in the classroom, we need it to be phenomenon based. So we want to show science how it is in the real world. And not all students have the same background knowledge as all of their peers. So we need to create that background knowledge by using videos of actual science or actual uh, processes that happen in the natural world. Once we have that background knowledge and we're testing more uh, information or we're trying to gather more information, we can do teacher demos if we have supplies in our classroom. It's even better if we can create these uh, experiments at home for our students using common household items. So I am currently exploring plate motion in my classroom. And you know, uh, the mantle looks just like what's underneath a chair. And our tectonic plates are just what a towel looks like placed on top of the chair. So we can uh, move the towels just as our plates would move. And then we need to make our content relatable to all of our students. We can't just isolate it to something that a small group of our students uh, can understand. We need to talk through these processes uh, so all of our students can be engaged. And we want to encourage our students to vocalize their ideas. And that can either be done through a chat, it can be done through a small group discussion in a breakout room, but we want to have that discourse that all of our students uh, can participate in. And when they're giving their ideas, we need to give responsive feedback. And that needs to be immediate. I use Pear Deck because I can give all of my students very quick feedback immediately when we're on that same slide. And then I always use 
guiding questions to lead our conversation. And so our conversation has substance. I don't want just that surface level, this is what it is. I want them to be able to apply what we're learning in my class to other situations outside of the classroom. So I have provided a couple links down below. Um, the first one is some really engaging science lesson ideas. And then below that is the digital interactive notebook that I created for our matter system here in Nevada. Um, so I would like to share those resources with you. And with that, I'll turn it back to Ms. Karen Tanaka. All right, and I am back to talk about testing in the COVID world. Um, there are some considerations when you are deciding to test either online or face-to-face. -face. We've actually gone through both already this year. So as far as online considerations, you do have to look at the validity of the test scores to really ask, you know, are these valid? Now, we do actually have a data person specifically for our Matter Academies, um, and she does talk about the validity of test scores. And what they have found is that the correlation between whether students are on the same track as far as based on last year type of um, data we were looking at, we are seeing that the test scores from the home testing is still pretty accurate. Yes, there are always going to be some outliers and some, you know, extraneous events, but for the most part, these test scores are truly valid. So we are still testing our students and making sure that we are seeing that growth that we want to see from all of our students every single year. So some of the other things that we need to question though, not the validity of the test scores is because we know at home, there could be distractions beyond the camera view. Right now, you're only seeing that tiny little screen, but how do we know there aren't giant monkeys crawling around in the backyard? We don't know. So again, because we don't know what's going on beyond the class, uh, the, beyond the window screen, that could also be something that could maybe mess up your test scores. Um, to alleviate that though, so we can monitor as much as possible, we do have a program called Go Guardian that we do utilize. It can monitor and control student activity online. So when students log into the Go Guardian portal, our teachers can actually see what websites every single student is on and they can see that live. So if maybe a child decides, oh, I'm kind of bored with this reading assignment, I'm gonna open up YouTube for a second, the teacher can see that immediately and say, oh, Johnny, we are not making very good choices right now, but I'm going to go ahead and X out of that YouTube screen and I'll have you go back to reading your article. So it does give our teachers at campus more power to be able to make sure that the students at home online are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. The other problem with the online testing at home are the internet capabilities and the technologies available. Um, other things to consider is not only is the internet, you know, is a good, strong connectivity, what do you do about makeup testing? Are you going to then bring kids in to test in your school structure for makeups? Or are you going to also hold those online on different days? Those are things you need to consider. Um, also, do you have a technology team who is available to support teachers if they're having internet issues? And again, if these are online considerations because kids are testing at home, what kind of technology support do we have for our families at home who are running into those problems during the testing time? So we want to make sure that we front load all of that. Also, we need to make sure, going back to the teacher training, we need to make sure that not only are teachers prepared on those programs, but we do also have to make sure that our students and our parents are also trained on all the programs that we are having them test, quiz, or whatnot on. So that's the online world. We're considering face-to-face -face and we are dealing with all these social distancing protocols. Um, number one, again, always goes back to your you know, city, state, country, wherever you are at in the world. But other considerations, again, still going back to the validity of the test scores. Um, something to consider when you bring on kindergartners, yes, we still had them testing on their computers. So the question is, how valid are those test scores? Because what a lot of our teachers realize with that being the first time some of our kindergartners have ever been to a school campus, some of them were just so overwhelmed just seeing the, school, seeing the halls, walking through, and they weren't even really ready you know, to be actually in the testing mode. So those are some other things you want to also think about per grade level. Is that going to be the best situation? Again, in this situation, we're just all trying to figure out best situation, best practices, but those are things you need to consider. Also, again, for pickup and drop off, 
social distancing protocols, are we following everything? Are we keeping our numbers where they should be? And is all the speeding and environment you know, appropriate to the social distancing protocols? And again, no matter what and where we are, internet and technology reliability, that's always going to be an issue. And again, you see the exact same things going down for the face-to-face -face considerations. Still in the COVID world, makeup testing still needs to be socially distanced, still needs to make sure that we are deep cleaning everything after students leave. So those are still considerations you wanna do and think about before you ever bring any of your students back on campus. So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and start wrapping that up. And here is Ms. Corona. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I know that was just really a snapshot of what we do here at Matter Academy. We have so much more, and um, we do have our emails up and um, all of our contacts in case you do want to reach out to any of us. If you have questions, we've been trying to answer questions in the chat as well. Um, Jake and Ray, do we want to open it up for questions, or I know it's kind of time. Uh, Dr. Ray, what do you think? Do we have a few more minutes? Uh, there we go. Oh, there you yeah. Thank you, uh, Matter Academy. Amy, this has been just so very helpful. Each one of your presenters has been so very, very uh, informative. Thank you. One of the things that I've really enjoyed seeing is the ideas that have been flowing back and forth from one participant to another. And uh, so what we what we hope we've done is not only to hear your expertise and the, your wonderful presenters, but it, there's this connection uh, among the people. And uh, I actually see Khaled Mohammed there now. And I introduced to Khaled uh, Wave so everybody knows who you are. Uh, he's the one who had this idea for this workshop and I wanna thank him for that. I think what we'd like to do with questions is uh, you can uh, obviously send your questions on our Facebook page. Uh, most of you are watching this on Facebook and we will either uh, uh, try to get Amy and her staff to look at them or we will look at them but uh, we'll try to get back to you. Again, you have the uh, email addresses of all the presenters. So if you want to uh, correspond uh, directly with them, uh, you'll be able to do that. So thank you again for this wonderful, wonderful, helpful presentation. We've learned things about several subjects that have, that Khaled actually has presented to us and said, these are the subjects people are having trouble thinking about online. And so hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, I, I just want to remind us all that, uh, and I've said this today, uh, Amy, I want to tell you, every one of your teachers and presenters obviously has a real exciting uh, job to do. We can't underlie, we can't under uh, state the importance of, of teachers because teachers encourage minds to think. They encourage hands to create and they encourage hearts to, to love. And you've done that today. I wanna to close with just something that I shared a few weeks ago in a workshop and uh, we've had such outstanding response. I wanted to share it again. In fact, we've had some teachers who have actually made a poster of this and put it on the wall of their classroom. And I, I, uh, I conclude with this, it's the I promise. And I encourage you all to consider this. I promise to care about you. I promise to be patient with you. I promise to help you when you're struggling. I promise to enjoy teaching you. I promise to be trustworthy. I promise to believe in you. I promise to make learning interesting, fun, and meaningful. I promise that I will challenge you to be your very best. I promise to do everything I can to help you succeed. I promise that no matter what, I will never give up on you. All of us feel that for these precious, precious lives who come into our lives every day. And remember, you might be the only reason a student comes to school today. So thank you so much, everybody. Dr. Jake, any concluding thoughts? Sorry, there are more informational topics. Uh, certificates are going to be mailed out within the next week. If you haven't received those certificates by Saturday, please email me. 
um, at info at arrayglobal.org. Also, I'm going to send out an email in the next hour or two, and in it we'll have the presentation, the link for the presentation, and also the post-workshop survey. We'd also like to invite you to another workshop on the 21st of this month. It is titled Marketing to Increase Enrollment During COVID-19. And again, this is a topic that we wanted to focus on because we're listening to you and the topics that you want us to focus on. And I know there's some other ideas and thoughts that you want us to focus on. Uh, this is one that, that has risen to the top from a lot of different schools. So we want to address that with you because a lot of private schools are struggling keeping their enrollment. So we wanna give you some thoughts and ideas on how to uh, best deal with that. So other than that, Dr. Ray, that's it. Uh, everyone will be hearing from me in an email in just uh, a few moments. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening. If it's evening, have a good day. If it's day, and have a good life, whatever. Thank Thanks you, so much. everyone. Thank you, thank you.